magic? Was that magic? Just How bad can a smile really be? The dictionary defines a smile as a pleased, kind, or amused facial expression, where the corners of a person's mouth are usually turned upwards, and the reason behind that is that something has made them happy. The Joker is a great example of how a smile can be used to convey fear and terror, but we'd argue Berserk gives us a far more unsettling example of an ever-smiling person with sinister undertones. Sonia was introduced to the story when Emperor Ganeshka launched his invasion on Midland. It's obvious what he means to you. <laughs> she was an ordinary girl with extraordinary perception, and because of that, she finds herself in a very unique position. With the world of reason having come to an end, the medium of the Falcon managed to find a place for herself on both sides of the fence. She worships Griffith, but has also become Shirka's friend, and though her smile makes her seem friendly enough, one can argue that she is a worse character than Nina in some ways, and that girl was the definition of toxicity. So, without wasting any further time, Let's talk about this, shall we? This is Sonia's Origins Explored. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. Now, this is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. It was worship at first sight. Sonia's introduction to Berserk. Much like many of the characters who now ride and die for the Falcon of Light, Sonia too was introduced at the beginning of Ganeshka's invasion of Midland. In fact, she was the first character introduced to us after the incarnation ceremony, who would go on to have a lasting impact on the story. But at least that much was evident from the beginning. As the Kushan army laid siege to the castle and town of Shet, we were given a few panels depicting the rank atrocities that they commit in the name of war. Prisoners shot on sight because of their refusal to serve as war slaves or their incapability to do the same. Ditches filled with helpless citizens and set aflame just because. Women defiled and chained, presumably to be taken to the capital city of Wyndham for the creation of more Dhaka soldiers. It was in one of these slave queues that we find Sonia, and at first it appears as though she has lost her mind because of the Kushan's brutality. All the women around are worrying about what would happen to them out loud. They had heard the rumours about how these East Eastern savages treated female prisoners, and they weren't keen on finding out whether this was true for themselves. They all despaired and desired for that saviour from the Hundred Year War to return and deliver them from their predicament. But one little girl's words put the winds of fate into motion. As the women around her pleaded for the White Falcon to return and save them from these Kushan savages, a young blonde-haired girl started muttering that their helping hand is coming. Her eyes were broader than daylight, and she stared ahead of herself as if she was in a trance. One of the captives asked another why she was behaving like this and were told that the girl saw her parents being burnt alive by the Kushan. She speculated that this was the reason for her seemingly mindless mutterings, but the girl remained adamant that the Falcon of Light was coming to save them. She heard the wind whisper it within her ears, and Sonia would be proven right by the end of the chapter, when Griffith just shows up outside of Shet in the middle of the Kushan main army, with nothing but a horse and armour. Sonia is one of the first people to realise that the man who had just materialised on the field of battle was none other than Midland's guardian angel, Sir Griffith the White Falcon. But following his ascension, the helping God Hand member Femto was perceived by the blind white sheep and sinful black sheep as the prophetic saviour known as the Falcon of Light. So when Zod and Locus showed up and started fighting the demon master, that was the name by which Griffith was addressed, and it stuck with the Midlanders watching his first miracle. The Falcon of Light moved past Salat at blinding speed and immediately slayed the Cushion general in charge of the battlefield, leaving his enemies in complete disarray. Every time they fired a volley of arrows at him, they would simply miss. As a God Hand member existing within a body of flesh, Griffith's existence was unique in the physical world. His power over those within the current of his story was absolute, and so it was impossible for something mortal to injure him at all. Of course, we as the audience know this fact. The observers of this savage assault on Kushan forces by three horsemen could only think of their feats as miraculous, and when one of the Kushan called their leader the Falcon of light, they instinctively knew their saviour had returned. Some thought he'd abandoned them, and others thought he had been killed at the order of the King of Midland, but people remembered Griffith's face from that day when Wyndham celebrated the end of the Centennial War, and they could see that this was the same man, clear as day. Sonia was enraptured by this revelation, and undid her bonds with her teeth, before running up to the person she knew was going to change the world. Up close and personal, Griffith appeared so beautiful to her that she thought he wasn't human, and we were screaming at her to run away because, of 
course he wasn't. And here is where an important question arises regarding Sonia's role in the story. If she possesses the power of prophecy, then why can't she see Griffith is the Falcon of Darkness? Her future friend Shirka, who was observing the events at Shet unfold from the body of a bird, knew instinctively that Griffith was both the Falcon of Light and Darkness at the same time. But for some reason, Sonia could only see him as the former. It was worship at first sight. Maybe it was her losing her parents so recently, or perhaps it was just the magnetic effect that the guardian angel of longing had on all those who went near him. You could tell by the way Miura drew Sonia in that moment that she had fallen in love with her god and hard. She was so awestruck by Griffith that she didn't notice Salat's to pass a lunge at him until it was too late. Sonia tried to warn Griffith of their approach, but turns out she didn't need to. Raxus beat her to it as he took on the mighty summit of the Bakiraka by himself. Sonia watched in amazement as the rest of Griffith's war demon commanders joined up with their master, and after they were done slaughtering, she described the aftermath of the carnage not as macabre, but as an inimitable painting. The stench and sight of blood everywhere should have made her fellow Midlanders feel sick to their guts, but instead they were all filled with divine worship for their angelic saviour. Sonia thinks to herself that surely now they were in the midst of some extraordinary tale, not knowing that she was acting as the narrator for Griffith's new life, whose sole goal was to acquire his lifelong dream. Maybe this is the reason why she took up the position she does in his camp. The medium of the Falcon and a prophetic telepath to boot Sonia's role in the reborn band of the Falcon. The next time we see Sonia surface in the story, it's also on a battlefield, but this time she's on the side doing the attacking. The small fiefdom of Lumius was under heavy attack by Kushan forces. The local lord and a few of his sons had died trying to protect it from Ganeshka's savage war machine. Mule Wolf Flame, the youngest and only surviving member of that noble family, was intent on protecting his citizens regardless of whether Griffith's liberation army arrived or not. His chivalrous intentions were rewarded so instantaneously that the appearance of the Band of the Falcon must have felt like a miracle for Mule, but for Sonia and Griffith, it was just another day at the office. As the Falcon of Light and his war demons mowed down the Kushan forces with the stunning arrow formation, Sonia used her telepathic powers to warn Mule of an incoming volley of arrows before he ran straight into it. And if you thought that was impressive, then the seer had something even better up her sleeve. Sonia had the unique ability to perceive the flow of thoughts and emotions. In any scenario, she could pinpoint the person who formed the heart of said scenario. This was especially useful on a battlefield, where locating generals was usually a difficult task. Sonia used her psychic powers to discern the flow of the Cushion Force's willpower and transmitted the general's location to Griffith telepathically. The Falcon took his information and flew with his majestic steed, striking the general's head off and putting his underlings to rout. And no, we didn't stutter when we said Griffith flew with his horse because that's exactly what he did to Mule, who was witnessing the Falcon of Light's miracles for the first time. This scene was nothing short of feeling like it was ripped out of a fairy tale. But to Sonia, well, it was just another day at work, as she and the rest of her party cheered on Lord Griffith with knowing smiles adorning their faces. When Mule arrived at the camp of the Band of the Falcon, he is shocked to see that it resembles a peaceful village on the move more than the Liberation War Band that it actually was. He wonders what the reason behind such serenity could be, and Sonia, having read his mind, tells him that it's Lord Griffith. She welcomes the young noble to the Band of the Falcon, named after that heroic group of mercenaries who had saved Midland from Tudor during the Hundred Year War, and she asks him to follow her because she knew what he wanted, a meeting with Lord Griffith. Mule was confused by this girl who kept reading all of his damned thoughts, and seemed to have a smile plastered permanently on her face. But with each new piece of information he learned about the Band of the Falcon, he became more grateful for her expositional presence. Mule had to accept the fact that not only was he going to be fighting alongside Cushion's soldiers and legendary knights like Sir Locus and Grunbeld, he was also going to stand shoulder by shoulder with the war demons, whom he could even tell were something inhuman. If Sonia had not been with him, he could have easily lost his life in the war demons' encampment, but thanks to the medium of the Falcons, he made it out of there alive. But it was in this part of the Band of the Falcons' war camp that we start to take notice of two very unsettling things. One, Sonia didn't exactly know what the war demons were, and two, she didn't really seem to care. We, as the audience, know that the apostles are the worst creatures to ever exist in the physical world. As beings driven solely by ego and desire, their job was to hate humanity and live to be hated by them. Mankind and apostles are diametric opposites, and we're sure if Sonia knew exactly how an apostle was made, she would have had her reservations in following Griffith so blindly. But then again, she saw her parents' 
burned to death in front of her very own eyes, so who is to say she would even care if she found that out? Even when she was being threatened with being turned into a meal by one of Griffith's apostles, she remained unbothered, telling him that she would complain to Lord Griffith personally when Grumbled told her to enter the war demon encampment. After informing him henceforth, she telepathically offered to bring a corpse for the same war demon that was trying to eat her a moment ago. On one hand, it's pretty gutsy to walk into a forest full of apostles unarmed and unbothered, but on the other hand, it's also quite stupid, wouldn't you agree? Sonia's promise of a fresh cadaver to the apostle who almost ate her seems like a charming little socializing tactic, but with the context we have, it's horrifying that a teenage girl is just going along with whatever is happening. And it's this context that also makes her adoration for what happens next so disturbing. When Mule and Sonia reach the Falcon of Light, the former is extremely unsettled by the white wisps that are floating about Griffith's head. Sonia explains that those wisps are the souls of the deceased who gave up their lives in the service of the Falcon of Light and are now being granted a final audience with their kin and loved ones. Mule is understandably creeped out by Sonia, finding the souls of the dead pretty, but he can't deny the borderline miracle that he was witnessing with his own eyes. Once the ceremony was over, Mew remained apprehensive, but Sonia was all smiles as usual. She leapt at Griffith and crushed him with a tight hug. The Falcon of Light thanked his seer for her work on the field that day, and Sonia told her idol it was nothing and that her power actually grew stronger in his presence. This is when Mule walks up to Griffith and asks a question that most Berserk fans had on their minds when this particular chapter came out. Where exactly did the souls of the deceased end up going to? Griffith said they go to a place where they become one, but Mule follows his query up by asking whether that place was heaven. Before he could ask about the other afterlife destination, Griffith simply told Mule he would find out for himself when the day came for him, and then added the young nobleman to his band after Mule too fell victim to instinctive reverence for the Falcon of Light. From this moment onward, the young Lord of Lumius became a brother of the Band of the Falcon and was assigned to be the sworn shield of Griffith's medium, Sonia. Rarely would the two be seen apart from one another, but it's worthy to note that Griffith would always keep his human companions far away from his magical conquests. When he sent his war demons to attack Flora's spirit tree mansion and then Ganishka's demon city of Wyndham, Sonia and Mule were noticeably absent from the action. They would resurface around 50 chapters after their last appearance and it would be in a city filled with humans. As the Black Swordsman party finally reached the holy port city of Vratanis, they were unaware of just how close their group was to the reborn band of the Falcon. Had Guts been aware of the fact that Griffith was nearby when he was talking about the White Falcon to Isidro, we think Britannus would have had an ugly introduction to the Berserker army. But it's interesting that Miura decided the intersection between these two groups should be explored through their respective youngest members, which is why Sonya's meeting with Shirka is such a turning point in the story for us. Because we, like Shirka, are aware of the nature of Sonya's beloved master. But we get this close to her finding out as well. A lonely kite, a dejected owl, and the great falcon of longing, Sonia meets her only friend before the world of reason comes to an end. Shirka and Ivalera absolutely despise the city of Vertanus when they step foot within its stony walls. The people drown out the voices of the spirits who used to dwell on these lands, and neither of them were prepared for the rank atrocities humans commit against one another for no reason other than mere convenience. When Shirka comes across a hanging gallows with the bodies of dozens of Kushin on display, she is enraged to discover the reason behind their deaths. Before it was chosen to become the main naval base of the Holy See during the Kushan invasion, Britannus was a merchant city where anything could be sold for the right price, including humans. While the mainland and the eastern border regions of the Holy See thought of the Kushan as nothing more than heathen savages who were hell-bent on claiming their ancestral land, in Britannus, the Kushan were a commodity. Kushan slaves could be seen working for Britannus elites all over the town before Ganishka began his invasion. But now that they were the sworn enemies of the Holy See, employing Kushin was seen as a problematic thing. So instead of selling them off again, or finding some sort of rehabilitation program for their slaves, the Vertanis nobility chose simply to slaughter them. Shirka was outraged by this revelation, and bewitched the soldiers overseeing the bodies into helping her cremate them so that their souls could finally be free. This ritual ended up releasing the trapped spirits of the dead in the form of white wisps that were quite similar to the rituals that Griffith performs after every 
every battle, and perhaps that was why Sonya, who was observing the entire ordeal, decided to seek out Shirka. She could have used thought transference to let Mule know that she was heading to the docks to chill with her new friend, but where's the fun in that? Besides, we are going to need that Isidro versus Mule Wolf Flame round 2 in the final act of Berserk, so there's that to watch out for as well. The medium of the Falcon was immediately able to tell that Shirka was a witch when she met up with her at the docks. Well, sure, our best girl was still decked out in her heirloom robes and carrying her hat and stick with her, but Sonya could tell that Shirka was talking to the seagulls, and she could see Ivalera too. And also, there was a little matter of Sonya having seen Shirka's badassery when she put those adults to work and gave those dead souls the respite they so sorely needed. So yes, which girl was cool in her books and she wanted to desperately make new friends. Sonya asks Shirka why she was in a city like Britannus when witches were said to make their lairs in the mountains or the woods, and the young mage wistfully told her new acquaintance that a lot had happened since she had arrived in the city. Sonya, who is a mind reader, a prophetess, an empathy, and basically everything psionic balled into one character, could relate to someone else's feelings for the first time. So she decided to ease Shirka's loneliness by telling her a fairy tale about an ugly duckling. Ivalera knew this story and was excited to hear it being recounted, but in Sonya's version, the ugly duckling was not a swan in truth, it was a kite. What follows is the tale of Sonya the seer, since that fateful day Griffith showed up at the city of Shet, and if you've seen our video on the Apostle Rosine, then you will notice eerie similarities between her and Sonya. Rosine, a heavily abused and ostracized child, began believing that she was Picaf the local legend who had cried himself to death after losing everyone he loved because he was different from them. If you want to catch up on that story, then we'd suggest you watch our Rosine video. But the point is, like the youthful apostle, Sonya was also vicariously living her life through a fairy tale. In the original story about the ugly duckling, said duckling would turn out to be a swan, and that's why it wasn't able to adjust within the duck family. But in Sonya's version, that duckling was a kite, and that kite was herself. She talks about how one day a murder of crows descended upon her pond and took all her duck friends captive. Because she didn't know how to fly, she couldn't do a thing to help anyone. That's when the king of birds arrived to liberate them from their horrid fates. It was a majestic white falcon. The falcon, with his dragons, was able to easily rout the crows from the duckling's home. He led a rampage across every pond in the land where the crows had laid their claw prints. Ducks, dragons, and even reformed crows joined his ranks. But the kite was special. Only she could fly in the same air as the falcon and wield a power similar to his. But all good things must one day come to an end because of politics, and so it was for the kite and the falcon. After the falcon had rescued the princess of the ducklings from her crow-made prison, the rest of her kind wanted to see them mate so that they could tie themselves to his kingdom more securely, but the kite wasn't impressed. She was the only one who could fly in the same air as the falcon, and so she thought she was the perfect one for him. But her opinion on the topic didn't matter, and so she found herself gazing at the setting sun which set the sea ablaze. In her sullen mood, she spotted an owl at the same place she was and realised they were one and the same. Though the owl was surrounded by seagulls, the kite knew she felt alone and wondered if they, who were similar to one another, could be friends. Shirka reciprocates this feeling by asking the same question out loud. And this is the first time we learn that Sonia is actually deeply in love with Griffith. She cannot stand Charlotte or her timid human behaviour and skills, but because she loved her leader so much, she didn't say a single word about it to him. If that reminds you of someone, then keep watching the video till the end because your thoughts are about to be validated and then taken to a very dark place. Sonia asks Shirka if she has some place where people understand her and syncs up with Ivalera in calling the young mage out for her feeling towards guts. The pair of newly made friends decide to return to their respective homes but are stopped in their paths by a group of pirates trying to round up Kush and kids for trade. Shirka is disgusted by the human's behaviour but Sonia is only excited. To her, everything that was happening that day was akin to an adventure from a fable. She openly called the literal kidnappers pirates without any hesitation and wondered out loud that maybe burning this city down wasn't such a bad idea if these kinds of characters were running around within it. Sonia is delighted when Shirka uses suggestion to stop an advancing pirate dead in his tracks and intrigued when Isidro shows up to save her thinking that he is the one that Shirka has a crush on. Sonia retracts that suggestion when she sees how much of a monkey Dropy is but she's also cognizant of the fact that Isidro's first objective here is to protect Shirka. When he yells at the young mage to not 
use her actual magic at the harbor. Shirka thinks Isidro is thinking this because he's angry, but Sonia points out it's because he doesn't want her to reveal her true colors. The young mage is shocked that this girl can hear her thought transference, but doesn't agree with her assessment that Isidro is heroic. Sonia cheers on Monkey Boy as he continues to dance around the grown-ups with his cutlass, but her adventure time is cut short when Mule finally catches up to her. She introduces him to her new friends as a duck knight and cheers him on in his fight against Bonebeard and crew, commenting that he might get promoted from domestic to wild duck if things went well. Obviously, they didn't. And Mule and Isidro ended up tag-teaming Bonebeard in the weirdest handicapped sword match that you'll ever see in your lives. The picture-perfect pirate managed to best both of them through sheer experience and Shirka prepared to finally use her magic, but Sonia stopped her from doing so because she sensed that things were going to be okay. A moment later, Sir Azan, the former vice commander of the Holy Iron Chain Knights, and Farnese's subordinate, rose from the boat that doubled as his bed at the docks and started clearing house. Sonia, Mule, Shirka and Isidro used the distraction provided by the moustache knight to get away with the cushion kids that they had managed to rescue. The young nobleman wonders how their escapade went so swiftly, but Sonia and Shirka simply told him it was their little secret. When Mule asks her what she wanted to do with the kids, she told him that they were going to take them along, of course. Mule, who was used to Sonia's impulsiveness by this point, sighed an annoyed breath, but the medium remained adamant. She did not wish to smear mud on a happy memory, and besides, their leader wasn't so cheap as to turn away rescued children. Oh, and if Shirka wanted to, she could join up with them as well. Sonia appealed to her hard on the basis of joining a melting pot of humans and inhumans who managed to coexist with each other despite their differences, unlike the young witch's experiences in Vratanus. Sonia entices Shirka with the promise of acceptance, and for a moment, her heart wavers. Then she senses Guts' thought transference and realizes she does have a place to call home after all. Shirka politely declines Sonia's gracious offer and the medium is seriously disheartened at the rejection. But as always, she takes it in great spirit. Sonia instead switches the topic to the man at the gates, who she realizes is Shirka's actual crush. And after finally introducing themselves to each other, the two friends part ways. The soaring kite, despite being turned down, leaves her owl friend with a promise and a premonition. She declares that she and Shirka will see each other once again, but also tasks her with getting away from Vritanis as soon as possible. Because Sonia, as a prophetess, could see and communicate events that were going to unfold in the future. And just to make that reunion so much more worse when it does happen, neither the kite nor the owl recognize the place they will have for each other once the world of reason comes to an end. After returning to camp, Sonia is once again peeved by the fact that Charlotte is the one who is supposed to receive Griffith's love and affection, and she seeks out Irvine deep within the woods. The apostle and the medium open up to one another, and for the first time, Sonia acknowledges out loud that she is tired of feeling lonely because she is different. Her whole life, she was able to see things things people couldn't, hear things people couldn't, but now she had found someone just like her and he was out of her reach. Sonia went to sleep, thinking how alike her and Shirka were in that regard, but while she was dreaming of a kite and an owl playing in a moonlit forest, the world of reason had started to come to an end. The unifier of mankind, the Falcon's high priestess, and yet another character set up for a Casca-esque revelation moment. How Sonia's origins tie into her fate. Since that first panel that she appeared in, there's always been something odd about Sonia. The fact that this girl, who apparently saw her parents burn to death at the hands of the Kushan, can keep smiling like every day is her birthday should be insane to a normal person. And that's because it is. There are more than enough hints across the story that Sonia Sonia is not in a mental state where she should be handling the kind of responsibilities that she's being given. In interviews he gave prior to his unfortunate passing, Kentaro Miura often clarified that there is a reason he stopped giving us Griffith's internal monologues following the incarnation ceremony. Many in the Berserk community were concerned that giving Griffith a savior storyline was going to whitewash all his heinous acts from the eclipse onwards. Heck, even before then. You only see Griffith through the eyes of the people around him, and Sonia is quite often the driver of this visual journey. Out of everyone in the band of the Falcon, she is the only one who, ironically enough, treats Griffith like a person. He might be the object of her longing, but that, at its core, stems from a need for companionship. Sonia's conversation with Irvine tells us that she never had a lot of friends growing up. Her powers, and the fact that she seems to randomly break into spouting prophecies like an oracle, must have made it very difficult for her to adjust. Given the fact that such things were taboo in the first place, we don't expect her parents to have been very supportive either. And 
well, this is berserk after all. Sonia already feels like too much of a Rosine for us to say it out loud, but what's driving her obsession with Griffith is not just the God Hand member's divine magnetism, it's also the fact that she quite literally feels like Picaf. Damn it, there it is again. Until the day that she meets Griffith, Sonia was like a caged kite, always having to mind herself around the ugly ducklings of the world, but with Griffith, she could soar the skies because they shared a similar understanding of the astral world. Though Sonia doesn't know anything about Arcana, she is already performing prodigious feats of magic. The reason why she relates to Griffith is because, like the God Hand member, she is very sensitive to the goings-on of the unseen world. But it's also because she doesn't know anything about that, Sonia is able to remain as aloof as she is. And yes, before you say it, we know that she can read people's thoughts all the time, but acknowledging and knowing are two different things. It's very telling that the night Griffith launched an attack on Ganeshka in Britannus with his war demons, he sent Sonia and Mule on a mission to fetch the Holy See's Pontiff, and the fact that they only returned after the Band of the Falcon had won that particular battle. It's also very important to note that Griffith never once tells Sonia off for her overattached behaviour. We think this is because Sonia is filling a role in the reborn Band of the Falcon that we can only see ending in tragedy. Before the arrival of the Black Swordsman, Casca was the only person who worshipped Griffith both as a leader and as a man. Even the White Falcon didn't realise that he was growing fond of her, as is evidenced by the brief vision he has of a family with her right before triggering the fifth eclipse. But after everything Femto has done to the former unit commander, we can't imagine Casca returning to Griffith in the same capacity. Someone else needs to fill in her role as most of Griffith's high-ranking apostles seem to be just replacements for the OG squad. And we can just see that burden falling to Sonya. And this is why it terrified us when we saw what she did during the final confrontation between Griffith and Ganeshka's forces. As the Kushan Emperor rose from the bowels of the astral world in his eldritch Shiva form, Sonya, in her oracle trance, declared it to be the beast of the end, the one who brings an end to the world of reason. It's hard to deny her statement, as Shiva was literally raining down hellfire upon Wyndham and creating hundreds of pseudo-apostles with every step it took. Sonya, who was out of her trance now, got really annoyed that Griffith told her to stay with the pontiff during such a dangerous battle. We felt mule when he asked her to listen to reason for once. But what she did next was perhaps more dangerous than running straight into the mouth of one of Ganeshka's spawns. Initially, Sonya listened and stayed back with the rest of humanity as Griffith advanced his war demons to meet the pseudos in battle. But once the God Hand commanded his servants to assume their released forms and the land outside Wyndham turned into a demonic battlefield, even Sonya couldn't help but be shocked by what she was seeing. It's only there for a couple of panels, but you can see she clearly didn't expect the war demons to be this monstrous, even though she had an idea. The rest of the Midlanders gathered around her rightfully started questioning Griffith's nature if he was going around commanding such inhumans. But it was here that Sonya's obsession beat out her common sense. As soon as she sensed human sentiment turning against Griffith, she called everyone gathered idiots via mass thought transference. Sonia berated the Midlanders for daring to think about the nature of the Apostles when they were the ones shedding blood on the front lines. She united their hearts by claiming all of them fought for the Falcon of Light, Griffith, as members of the Band of the Falcon and just to seal the deal, Sonia charged at one of Ganeshka's spawns herself. Mule began giving her chase because for all her bravado, Sonia couldn't swing a sword to save her life, but he didn't need to. Irvine had it sorted for him. The Hunter Apostle saves Sonia from getting herself killed and chides her for her childish peeving, but also commends her for bringing Griffith's forces together. Had Sonia not given that speech, the Band of the Falcon could not have performed the miracle of having humans and inhumans fight alongside each other willingly. We are in agreement with Daiba when he said this was highly unprecedented, given the abominable nature of apostles. But we think his thoughts got lost somewhere in the field of battle, which is why Sonia couldn't pick up on them. If she had, she might have realised just how majorly she was messing it all up. As Sonia rides on Irvine's uh, belly? Griffith flies up to Ganishka's head with Nosferatu Zod and, with an assist from Skull Knight's Sword of Actuation, triggers the great roar of the astral world. Sonya was ground zero for the events of Fantasia, and once the new world was born, she became the second most important asset for mankind. After Griffith, of course. As the medium of the Falcon, Sonya became a high-ranking member of the Holy See. Her duty at official funerals was to use her power to guide the spirits of the dead towards their relatives for one last meeting before they joined that place where they all become one. When she wasn't on state duty, Sonia was busy helping Griffith execute his otherworldly war plans against a whole host of new, far more durable enemies. 
and saving Mule from close calls with death as usual. The medium of the Falcon demonstrates that her prophetic eye can pierce through more than the mind. And she helps Griffith use a grove of literal touchstones to navigate through the branches of the world spiral tree and bring the band of Falcon back to Falconia in no time. Apparently, Sonya was able to see and perceive the dragon path of the astral world, one of its most dangerous and deepest spiritual walkways, without even knowing what it was. With the discovery of these sky paths, as the puny humans would call them, Griffith was able to accomplish his goals that much faster, which meant he had to rely on Sonya that much more. But she wasn't complaining. She'd race to the end of the earth if Griffith called. But we do wonder if she would still do that after what happens in Chapter 371. Because while Griffith has returned, he has done so with Casca in his arms. The branded girl is unconscious because of being in the presence of a God Hand member for the moment, but Sonya doesn't know this or Casca. What will happen once she senses the sheer dread Casca harbors in her heart towards Griffith? And what will happen when Sonya and Shirka reunite? Because the medium has already declared that the owl and the kite will meet once again in life, but they lie on the opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of who Griffith truly is in Berserk's story. You see, there are two prophetic falcons that are meant to be floating about in the sky underneath the dead sun right now. The Falcon of Darkness and the Falcon of Light. The latter is what most of the world, including Sonya, perceive Griffith as. But we, as the audience, and Shirka, having been taught magic by Flora, know that Femto is actually the Falcon of Darkness, whose incarnation has allowed his fellow God Hand members to take form in the physical world as well. As of now, his goals for humanity, whom he has cooped up in the massive sacrificial pen that is Falconia, remains unclear. Knowing the pattern of events in Berserk, it might very well be another massive human sacrifice ritual for yet another insane demonic advent. If that is the case, then Berserk's final arc is going to have something that will make the Eclipse feel tame in comparison. And sticking with that line of thought, Sonya becomes key, because once she realises how wrong her perspective has been so far, she could end up becoming the key to bringing Femto down. There are so many things that are possible thanks to Miura's ability to set up big events with such intricate details, but alas, we're all going to have to wait for an announcement to see if we even get the Sonya Shirka reunion. As of today, it has been over three months since Chapter 371 came out and there has been no announcement from Studio Gaga or Koji Mori regarding its resumption. Hopefully that will change in the summer, but one thing that will not change is how intrigued we are by Sonya's future. While the aloof and abused teenage girl didn't know any better before getting stuck between a rock and a hard place, it will be interesting to see if she tries to get out of it or lets it crush her into despair, like Nina did all those chapters ago. Marvelous verdict. And that's it for this video. Sonia is a divisive figure in the Berserk community, and honestly, we get it. We too would not trust you if you gave us puppy eyes constantly and had a smile plastered across your face, even when you were riding a literal demon from hell. But that narrative tension is honestly what makes Sonia one of our favorite characters from Berserk. We don't like her because of who she is, we like her because we know what she can become once she realizes she has literally been dancing with the devil. Sonia is someone with a strong moral compass, and when things get down to it, she will do what she thinks is right, no matter what someone else makes of it. If she were to flip to the Black Swordsman party, she would become their greatest asset instantaneously, and that is the possibility we are most excited about exploring. But until then, what did you think of Sonya? Do you think her reverence for Griffith is just a right place, right time deal? Or do you think causality is at work here? Let us know in the comments section down below. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't done so already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.